New York NY Launchpod starts 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 now. Welcome to the New York Launchpod, a podcast on new startups, businesses, and openings in the New York City area. I'm Hal Cooper Smith, and my guest in this episode is Asha Carroll, the founder of Cake in a Crate, which is a vegan, gluten free, processed, sugar free cake mix that you bake. I think it tastes great. It is so easy to make that I was even able to make it myself. And for anyone who knows me, that just goes to show how easy it is. I brought the cake to my Thanksgiving dinner for some actual reviews. Here's my cousin Lindsay Amper. That noise in the background is our Thanksgiving dinner going. What's your name? <laughs> Lindsay. And how do you know me? How did you like the cake that I made? I thought it was pretty good. Did it taste like it was gluten free? It tasted good. I tasted really good. And here's Lisa Salerno, married to my cousin Brian. I really liked it. I thought it was nice and what is sweet, chocolatey, and I liked the little bit of saltiness to it. If you want to try cake in a crate yourself, Asha is offering all New York Launch Pod listeners twenty percent off their first order with code. NY Launch. I think it's a great product to try, particularly this time of year around the holidays as a gift for someone, or maybe you're just headed to a potluck. Now, let's go to the interview. Stepping onto the launch pod, we have Asha Carroll, the founder of Cake in a Crate. Thank you for stepping onto the launch pod, Asha. Thank you for having me, Hal. I'm excited to be here. So what is Cake in a Crate? Cake in a Crate is the plant-based baking kit. Every ingredient comes perfectly measured to make an impressive homemade dessert. And uh, we make it easy for you. We source the ingredients, we curate beautiful recipes, and we break it down step by step so that it's easy to make, whether you're a first time baker or whether you're an old pro. And what does plant based cooking mean? So that sounds a little bit weird to me. Okay, sure. Plant based is anything that's derived from a plant as opposed to derived from an animal. So I would say plant-based is a more modern term for vegan. You're seeing it more and more with plant milks, with alternatives to butter and dairy and eggs. More and more we're getting plant-based as the term in the news, in the media. But plant-based essentially means, like I said, anything derived from a plant, but chocolate can be derived from a plant, Uh, flax seed can be derived from a plant, almonds are a plant. We're not just talking about spinach and uh, carrots and uh, all that kind of good for you vegetable stuff. So I was looking at your website, your gluten-free, vegan, kosher-friendly, Processed, sugar-free, anything else that I'm missing? A lot of our kits are paleo, uh, which seems contradictory to vegan, but there's actually a lot of synergy between those those two diets when you get into baked goods. And, uh, yeah, we try to make things taste as great as possible and simultaneously as good for you as possible. And they're desserts, so it's good for des- you. Definitely. No, it's dessert. Oh, it's dessert. Um, it's not... And uh, don't get me wrong, I love a good avocado pudding, but, I mean, you have to use sugar, you have to use oil, you have to use salt. It's all those things that make for a wonderful, decadent baked good. We're taking those classic ingredients and we're healthing them up, so to speak. It's still an indulgence. I wouldn't say that you're going to be eating it for every meal, but it's probably healthier than most breakfasts you'll have. (laughs) Does it taste good? Because I couldn't believe that. Yeah. So we take taste very seriously, and uh, we know there are going to be some skeptics. So we actually employ a team of test bakers throughout the country who test our products to make sure that they, quote, don't taste vegan, don't taste gluten-free. And we want it to taste as good, if not better, than your classic butter, sugar, flour, eggs, baked good. Well, I couldn't believe that it would taste good, but I actually made one of your cakes in a crate, was able to bake it myself, which I was very impressed that you were able to simplify it, that someone like me could even bake the cake, 
and it does taste amazing. How do you do it? Well, first, thank you, and I'm, I'm so glad that you had the opportunity to give it a try. Uh, I feel like you should win a prize yeah. for engineering <laughs> if I'm able to do it. Um, like I said, we take our recipe development very seriously. I'll give you a tip, which is that chocolate makes anything taste great. <laughs> in my opinion. If it has chocolate in it, uh, you're getting my vote. Uh, but in all seriousness, for us, it's all about ratio and conversion. So a lot of our recipes are developed from standard butter, sugar, flour, eggs uh, recipes, like I mentioned, and we convert down recipes one ingredient at a time to make sure that they achieve that balance, that they do taste sweet enough, that they do have the lift that eggs provide, that they do have the fattiness, the creaminess uh, that you'll get from a rich buttercream, for example. And quite honestly, we work with food bloggers and recipe developers who really know their stuff. So uh, we're entrusting our product into really good hands. How long does it take to develop a recipe? Because I'm thinking when you're dealing with your recipes, you're not dealing with someone's great grandparents' recipe that was gluten-free, processed sugar-free, every paleo back in the day. You're coming up with new items. Yes. It takes us about one month, start to finish, from conception all the way through production for a recipe. So, and what that entails is, like I said, a whole lot of testing. We're big fans of group feedback. So any single one of our testers is required to serve it to a group of people. Bonus points if it's people who don't eat vegan or gluten-free. And anybody says that it tastes healthy, we go back and we tweak, we tweak. Again, all that said, we really got it streamlined. And that's just thanks to the way that we run our communication for it. And... Uh, Again, we take it very seriously. We like dessert, and that's number one. And number two is that we're going to make it healthy. So it's got to taste viable as a good dessert. Let's go a little bit more behind the scenes yeah. in terms of the process. Yeah, let's How do many it. cakes are being baked before something comes to a final recipe? And it, uh, because I'm always wondering, all right, so if you take a tablespoon out of here or mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. salt, like how long does it actually take? Sure. A recipe will start with uh, usually an ingredient as an inspiration. And so the idea is how can we take this ingredient and uh, show it off? How can we maybe show people uh, something about this ingredient that they don't know? Do most people know that tahini acts as a fabulous egg substitute? Probably not. Um, when you had me making flax eggs, I could not... <laughs> Yeah, flaxseed is a good one. And, uh, you know, it sounds so grandma and grandpa, but uh, yeah, flax eggs are great. And a lot of these things have been around the vegan community for a long time, but they have not yet or they are just hitting the mainstream. So, again, it's about taking an ingredient that may sound a little out there and showing people that it's really not so difficult. How hard was it to make your flax eggs? It was not difficult not at all. It difficult? just required water and the flax that you had. Stirred it up. Stirred it up. Yeah. See, so there you go. Um, you know, it's really, it's just about opening your mind, I think, a little bit and, uh, you know, using some things you may not have used before. But back to development. So we'll start with an ingredient as an inspiration. And then our recipe developers, who are prominent food bloggers, that's who we're working with, they'll pitch a recipe to us. Or they'll actually pitch a few recipes to us. And then... We number crunch and we work into what is the most viable to get into a product. And we also do polls through our testing network, which is what do people actually want? Do people want carrot cake or do they want cinnamon rolls? This is a hard question. And what do the people want? You know, uh, like I said, people love chocolate. People love something that can be eaten for breakfast or any time. And people love, and we have found this more and more, though our name is Cake in a Crate, people love cookies. People love bars. People love things that they can bring to any kind of event. So uh, that's what we're finding more and more. So you'll always find a few uh, celebration cakes on our site. But I think more and more we're getting into that everyday dessert, which is what is a dessert that I can have on a Wednesday. And what is a dessert that you can have on a Wednesday? Oh, 
let me tell you some of my favorites. So currently we have something called Salty Date Caramel Scotcheroos uh, available in a cake and a crate. And have you ever heard of a Scotcheroo? I have heard of a Scotcheroo, okay. but probably okay. from your website. But, <laughs> well, so I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Minneapolis. And there the dessert bar is king. That's because you take a few ingredients, you mix them up in one bowl, fewer dishes to do, and you lay them into a pan. It's completely no bake. You put it either on your countertop, in your fridge, wait a little while. It's ready to serve for dinner or to bring to a picnic or to bring to a birthday. So scotcheroos are kind of a fun mix. Uh, it's traditionally, it's Rice Krispies, caro syrup, butterscotch chips with a layer of chocolate on top. So we took it and uh, we worked with one of our food bloggers. Uh, she's named Heartbeat Kitchen. And uh, she's also from the Midwest, so she understood this dessert. And she incorporated dates into the recipe. Dates, another grandma and grandpa food. Here we go. But you actually heat up the dates. You get a date caramel. You salt it, a little bit of cinnamon. You uh, use maple syrup, brown rice syrup, to stick the brown rice crisp cereal together. And uh, you pour some really quality dark chocolate on top, a sprinkling of Malden salt. And there you go. So that's just an example of how we took, you know, a really kind of questionable ingredient list and uh, made it something that's just a little bit healthier for our customers. How long does it take to make one of your recipes? I would say most of our recipes can be completed in less than an hour. I would say about 30 minutes of active prep time, which is pretty standard. I would say even if you're making a box mix, we can talk about box mixes. Um, but even if you're making a box mix, that's going to be, you know, between 15 to 30 minutes prep and then about 30 minutes to bake. And then I would say another 30 minutes plus to cool. But with these no bakes, I'm telling you, people are wanting no bakes more and more. People want that instant gratification. If it's summertime, people don't want to turn on their ovens. A no bake can be achieved in much less time. So uh, we're re really interested in those. And it seems like you rotate some of your recipes. We do. Uh, definitely, we believe in seasonal desserts. So at this time of year, you're going to see our caramel apple spice cake. We have a recipe called pumpkin pocket pies, which is our take on a classic pumpkin pie with a buttery crust. We found ways to make all that happen. So we'll do things like that during the colder months. And during the summer, you're going to be seeing, uh, in this next coming year, you're going to be seeing things that can be served chilled. So um, modern takes on like an icebox cake, things that can be kept in your refrigerator or your freezer and served that way. So uh, we definitely rotate things out. If something is a crowd favorite, we'll bring it back. But at all times, we kind of have a rotating roster of recipes as well as uh, those mainstays that are going to be there all the time. And we really... We like to listen to our customers. We, If something is selling very well, it's going to be in our shop for a long time. How did you come up with this idea? So I was what you call a stress baker. Uh, so I was singing opera, and I would have all this energy when I got home from rehearsal at night. We would usually rehearse until 10 or 11 o'clock. And, singing uh, opera in New York? Singing opera, yeah, in New York. And I was traveling a lot as well, mostly through the U.S. and a little bit in Europe. And I would get home, and instead of wanting to go to bed, I would want to bake something. And again, maybe that's the Midwesterner in me. I'm not sure. But I have always had a major sweet tooth, and I've always loved to bake. So, But I, I was a home baker uh, for a number of years, um, my, whole, my whole life, actually. And I would come home, and I would bake something up. And so then the next day we would have it, maybe I would serve it at a rehearsal, maybe I would serve it at a dinner party, serve it to my friends. And it was just kind of an ongoing cycle. Just to get a little bit personal, whether it was the stress of moving to New York City or it was all of my nightly baking efforts, I gained a lot of weight <laughs> with my activity. And um, so when I decided to lose it and I wanted to keep baking, I had to find some other ways. So I started to get into alternative diets. Uh, I had been a vegetarian on and off for about 10 years. 
and I uh, was starting to dip into the dairy-free and to the gluten-free, finding that I was feeling better, finding that I was, uh, you know, losing weight and still essentially getting to have my cake and eat it too. And uh, so I'd start making these recipes, and these are what replaced my mainstays. These are what I was bringing to dinner parties, sharing with friends. And after a little while, I found I was getting better feedback on my gluten-free and vegan desserts than I was on my old standbys. People would ask me for the recipe, but when I told them the ingredients inside, they'd get a little bit overwhelmed. They'd say, well, oh, I'd never buy almond flour. You know, I don't bake very often. I know that's expensive. Oh, I, you know, I, I don't keep dates on hand. All I have is white sugar. But the people wanted the desserts. Uh, and they wanted what they saw on Pinterest, and they wanted what they saw on Instagram or on food blogs. So um, at this time, I'd kind of been working my mind around a couple of startup ideas already. And we kind of had a convergence of meal kits rising to the front of the pack when it came to startups. We had subscription boxes, and we had plant-based and vegan and gluten-free foods just reaching the mainstream. So myself and uh, my co-founder, we had this idea. What if we made it accessible for people to bake using healthier methods, using healthier ingredients, to bake vegan, to bake gluten-free, to bake uh, refined sugar-free? And what if we use the concept from the meal kit, which is to pre-measure everything. So that takes some of the biggest work out of baking, the measuring. To pre-measure everything, individually package it so that people can have a relationship with that ingredient. They can get to know these ingredients one at a time rather than having your run-of-the-mill powdered sugary box mix, which we were starting to see. You know, if you look at the numbers, box mix sales have been down. Natural food sales have been up. And I just saw a window of opportunity. And I said, I'm going to test this out. I'm going to test it out on my friends. And I'm going to see what they think. So that was step one. And then what was that moment when you said, actually, I'm going to quit singing and this is what I'm going to do? So I know a lot of singers who are entrepreneurs. And of course, a lot of singers who have day jobs. It happens, I think, in any creative category that you get people who are willing to think outside of the box and who are looking for better ways to do everyday things. And I had these entrepreneurial urges and I had these things I was testing out and I thought maybe that they could live in the same tank, that I could put them in the same tank and they could fight it out and uh, we could see which one went over. And... Every day that I went on, um, I just realized that there was a need for this. I realized that the world might not be missing something if I wasn't singing. But if I wasn't putting full force into this idea um, that I had for Cake in a Crate, uh, that it might not come to fruition. I really had to make that hard choice. And... You know, I can still remember the day that I, I wrote to my voice teacher. I said, you know, I'm going to be taking an extended hiatus. I don't know if I'll be back. And I didn't go back. And the more and more that I began working with other food entrepreneurs and I partnered up with food bloggers and ingredient brands, and I started to really understand the need for what we were doing, it just became so clear. It became so clear. And uh, God, I'm having a fun time. I'm having a great time. And uh, it's been about two years. So this world was totally new to me when I started exploring it. Do you have any competitors? Cake in a Crate has no immediate competitors. <laughs> um, but there are a couple of products that are doing something similar. You may have heard of Foodsters, which is... Sarah Michelle Geller's uh, baking product, which is kind of an arts and crafts thing for kids. They operate on a subscription model. They don't use artificial dyes, but uh, you won't find vegan with them. You'll rarely find gluten-free. Uh, kind of a fun thing for kids. 
we are friends with a New York baking startup called Red Velvet NYC, and they do what we do, but for conventional cakes. So their cakes use eggs and butter and milk, and they'll actually ship to you those dairy ingredients. So I really respect what, what they do in terms of logistics. On the other side of things, we have the meal kits. So we have products like Blue Apron, obviously, um, which is in sort of, you know, our, our parallel market. And we have Purple Carrot, which is the vegan meal kit. And we have big respect for Purple Carrot and are happy to be friends with the folks over there. But I mean, to be honest, as of right now, we're the only people doing exactly this. You've, we've started to see a couple of meal kits adding in some dessert options, but nobody's entirely vegan and gluten-free. And, uh, I feel confident in saying that nobody is highlighting food bloggers the way that we are. And we've found a real, uh, a real home uh, in promoting their, their creations and their recipes and bringing them to new audiences. And so where do you fit on the, for lack of a better term, spectrum in terms of who your audience is? Someone who doesn't want to go to a bakery to buy a cake or buy a dessert, but also an enthusiast who probably already has the ingredients. Who is your your customer and how are they getting to you? Our customers are busy people. It's a lot of New Yorkers. It's a lot of Californians, but it's a lot of people all across the country. We have two types of people who use cake in a crate. It's either people who are too busy to go out and get the ingredients and source the recipes themselves, or it is people who do not have access where they are in the country to say that bag of almond flour or flax meal. So uh, the former is what we're getting in those major cities, uh, which is people who may be big followers of blogs, uh, very active on Instagram or Pinterest, but they're just not necessarily that all the time baker, but maybe they want to be. We make it possible. You can think of us as a an in-between kind of place. Uh, you can think of cake in a crate as a helper tool, an introduction. But to be honest, a lot of our customers are also experienced bakers who have not yet worked with these ingredients before. Maybe it's somebody whose husband or wife has uh, a recent celiac diagnosis. Maybe it's somebody who uh, has... Uh, been suggested by their doctor to consume a little less animal fat. We hit pretty far across the board in all directions, but I would say most of our customers are new to this lifestyle and are eager to learn more. So we really value our position as, I would say, honestly, a, a baking education tool. Again, it goes beyond what you would get from a box mix. It is interactive. And our hope is that when someone is done baking a cake in a crate, they feel more accomplished as a baker or as a friend or as somebody who's hosting Thanksgiving for their relatives. How fat will I get by eating your desserts? <laughs> well, um, okay, so... I mean, it, it, it. we use coconut oil. We use coconut butter. We use coconut sugar. We use maple syrup, dates, uh, brown rice syrup, as I mentioned. It's still sugar, and it's still fats. But in terms of your health, I think you're going to be a lot happier. And I don't think you're going to get that sinking feeling in your stomach after you eat a cake in a crate. Uh that you may be used to experiencing after Thanksgiving dinner or after uh, a slice of chocolate cake. It's going to be different. I think you're going to notice that you feel better. Um, can you get fat? Oh, sure. But I, I lost 40 pounds eating cake in a crate. So that's just me. <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> While eating dessert. Uh, that's, that's my way. Well, what, I didn't want to stop, so I had to find a way. It still blows <laughs> me away that it is delicious. How much does this cost? So 
Cake and a Crates currently run between $25 to $35, but we're continually diversifying our line to add lower cost options and uh, again, those everyday desserts that I mentioned. So next time you head to our website, you may see some lower cost options on there as well. To us, it's important to make Cake in a Crate accessible to a wide variety of people while still providing a really luxurious, decadent experience. And I love that all the ingredients were pre-packaged for me. How is that sorting it out on your end? What is that like? Sure. Uh, We are very detail-oriented when it comes to our production. (laughs) So for us, that means portioning everything individually, and it means having a stock of, let's call them SKUs. So we use the measurement one cup chocolate in a number of our desserts. We use the measurement one third cup coconut oil in a number of our desserts. So you can think of it as a mix and match of ingredients. So on a logistics standpoint, we keep a large catalog of ingredients and that's what our recipe developers have to work with. And uh, They, you know, they take what we have and they run with it. And uh, I would say really the sky's the limit when it comes to combinations. Uh, You can think of it as baking Legos. You can kind of make anything. And what's the back end like? The actual logistics? Do you have just a big warehouse of all these gluten-free, fun recipes? So it is a gluten-free zone. That's absolutely certain. Again, we have a lot of customers with dietary or allergy restrictions, so we keep that We are very serious about, uh, you know, all of our certifications. But in terms of how it works, we receive raw ingredients, be it flours or uh, be it nut butters or chocolate or anything in between. We receive the raw ingredients. Then we portion those by weight into all of our different containers, which are also eco-friendly. That's also really important to us and to our customers. And... Those are what we keep on our shelves, and those are what we fill into our cake and a crates. As you know, cake and a crates don't require refrigeration, so that's really great, I think, for both our customers and for us in terms of what we do at our warehouse. To us, it really helps us with distribution so that we're able to get to customers in currently the 48 continental states and uh, hopefully soon Alaska and Hawaii. Well, that was one of the things that I was fascinated by because I had this actual box, which looked beautiful, and the ingredients didn't expire for a long time, and you can just store it for for how long? That's right. Um, well, it really depends based on the ingredients, um, but I would say three to six months for every cake in a crate. There are a couple of ingredients that if you refrigerate them, they'll keep even longer, uh, like, say, almond flour or maple syrup. But we're really proud of our shelf life. Between you and me, I don't think it'll last on your shelf too long at home. But it is highly giftable because of that. And right now we're heading into our busiest season, of course, with the holidays. And I think a lot of people like that about cake and a crate. It is something that you can wrap up and and give and not worry about uh, sticking in the refrigerator. One of your biggest challenges, I imagine, must be overcoming the obstacle of someone thinking it is all these things, gluten-free, processed sugar-free, it's going to taste awful. How do you overcome that, particularly on the web and everything else that you're doing? Yeah, our joke is that our cakes are actually just made of air. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's all they are. Uh, but no, um, in all seriousness, we find that Number one, it has to taste good. And number two, it has to look good. But in terms of our customers, we've had great success presenting our product in a visual way. And we've developed uh, quite the following and customer engagement via Instagram and, uh, and Pinterest for that matter. If a dessert looks good, people are going to be a lot more trusting of it. Um, You'll see on a lot of websites, uh, you might see some vegan things or gluten-free things that look a little bit questionable uh, in their photos. So that's number one is we really want to show off how beautiful they are. 
And number two, we believe that once our customers or their friends and family taste it, they won't know the difference. Actually, one of my favorite stories, one of our testers fed her neighbor cake in a crate, and this neighbor was gluten-free and vegan. So our tester thought it would be a perfect match and she should try it. And the neighbor came back to her and she said, I can't believe you. You told me this was gluten-free and vegan and there's no way it is. I know what that tastes like and I don't believe it. You know, why would you give this to me? (laughs) And uh, obviously it was gluten-free and vegan. So you really just have to taste it to, to taste the difference. Again, we, we believe in our ingredients and we work with some really top-notch purveyors and we believe in our bloggers and our recipe developers and uh, it's got to taste good. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe in it tasting good. That's number one. Well, it does. And so when people <laughs> do make it, yeah. how often do they come back? We are very fortunate when it comes to our return customers. So we get a lot of referrals. We have families cross country who've baked through cake and crates together. So they'll order for the whole family to bake and then they'll kind of do sharing across social media. We love how engaged our customers are on social media too. If they make something beautiful, they want to share it. So that's been really rewarding for me personally to see what everybody's been creating and People put their own little spins on it, regardless of what pan they're baking it in or how they're doing the decorations on top. That's really fun to see. So you mentioned that you're sold throughout the country. What are your biggest markets? So I would say at this point, we still definitely get our most sales from the coasts. So say New York, California, D.C., but more and more as our company grows, we are getting customers in the middle of the country, Ohio, Indiana, Chicago is big for us, my hometown, Minneapolis. And actually we used Minneapolis as a bit of a testing market when we first started out because I wanted to see if it could catch on as well there as it did for us in New York and California. And uh, results have been really good. We see people, again, I would say some of these ingredients aren't as readily available. And especially if people don't have a whole food for example, in their backyard, or, you know, maybe they're a little overwhelmed by, you know, ordering on Amazon or on Thrive Market, which is a company that we love. We can be that introduction. So to answer your question, we're really seeing a widespread at this point in time. And for us, every time we see a new spot on the map light up, we're really excited because maybe we're bringing gluten-free to an area that has a really limited choices and we're making it available. <laughs> How many cakes in a crate do you ship out per week, per month? Sure, no problem. So right now we are shipping out about 100 cake in a crates every week, but with right now being holiday season, <laughs> I don't want to answer that because it's a little frightening. Uh, holiday season last year really took us, uh, last year was our first holiday season in business, and it really took us by surprise in a good way, but we receive about half of our yearly sales during holiday time. So, you know, I 